So critical thinking is important to how we understand problems before we apply solutions. And that's going to become really important this semester in how you look at the problem you have to complete for the, the project, for the capstone project. It's also important in how we look at problems in general in life, in our job, in whatever we do. Because too often people solve problems without understanding the problem and in essence apply the wrong solution or sometimes problems aren't meant to be solved but just understood. And so we have to understand that and that gets done through how we look at critical thinking. So if we think of critical thinking as an intellectual process, this is something that mentally we apply, uh, not necessarily physically. We can use some physical tools to help us understand problems, but in essence, it's how we apply our mind to a problem and structure the problem itself. So that takes on a lot of different things as in analyzing and synthesizing and gathering information and observing all these great words that give context to problem understanding. In essence, then, given us an ability to apply action to the problem. And what we hope, because it's critical thinking and not just thinking, it's actually appropriate action. So when we're looking at problems, we have to think about them and from them. And what that means, and I'm going to give you four constructs on how we can begin to think about and from problems. So the first one is perspective. And perspective is understanding that we all look at a problem differently, and that difference is based on our truth, and our truth is based on what we know. And we have to understand that an individual's truth, based on what they know, is correct. Now, that's a hard concept to, to sort of grasp with, but if you start from that point, understanding that all perspectives are true and to that individual is correct, we have a better ability to begin to understand differences and similarities in how we look at problems and find solutions. And so you see this a lot if you, if you follow, I love following uh, world politics and US politics and just what's going on in the global economy, in part because there's so many perspectives looking at an individual problem that it makes for the solution very difficult. And so that's always, I find, interesting to see people's perspectives and how those perspectives are based on what they know and how they see that. So whether we're looking at a border wall between the United States and Mexico, or we're looking at the UK uh, threatening to leave the European Union through Brexit, whatever it is, there is an always multiple perspectives to this. It's very similar to understand how we bring these perspectives together and see how they mash, see how they disagree, but respecting them. The second one is boundary. What I mean by boundary is that in order to understand a problem, you have to know where the boundary of the problem is. And it can't be your problem if you can't influence the problem itself to a solution. In essence, that if you can't influence it, it's not your problem, and it's somebody else's problem. Now, you may be part of the environment, the external force, but you're not going to be part of the internal force. And so you have to have problem owners, and those owners are within that boundary. And so we think of passive and active problem owners. And so a, an, active passive, an active problem owner is somebody that can influence the, the problem, and the problem can, in essence, influence them. So things that I deal with in my own life with respects to, um, you know, what I'm going to do in a given day is I can influence what happens, but also that in what I do interact with can influence me. And so that's part of my sphere of influence in my boundary. But I can think of external things, which we call passive uh, influences on a problem. And so passive influences on a problem, if I think about product development and me selling a product on the internet, on Amazon, uh, I can influence the product because I own it, I've developed it, so that makes me active, an active problem owner uh, or active product owner. But an external or passive sort of influencer would be someone like FedEx with shipping. So I don't tell FedEx how to ship. I don't tell FedEx how to create a price structure so that I can sell my product. 
FedEx tells me. So FedEx influences what I do, but I don't influence FedEx. So they become an external in, uh, problem. Essentially, I wouldn't call them an, quite an owner, uh, you know, but, but they are part of the, my solution space, but external to that. So I can't influence them. So when we draw that boundary, we have to understand what can we influence and what can we not. So we talk about that as the sphere of influence in how we define our boundary of problems. The next one is togetherness. Togetherness talks about uh, how things connect, relationships, what influences what. Is it a strong relationship? Is it a weak relationship? And how do those strong and weak relationships sort of sometimes tension, battle each other, and how do they influence each other? And we need to understand how those things are connected and where our influences are. So the, an example of that was uh, Chrysler Motor Company was trying to understand where they had a problem on an actuator with their cars that kept failing and they couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, so they actually started to look at the sphere of influences to the problem. And so they started looking at who makes the actuator. Then they looked at who makes the alloy to the actuator. Then they looked at uh, who makes the clay that is used in the manufacturing process of the alloy to make the, the uh, actuator. And what they found out is that there was a company that was making clay for kitty litter and also making clay for uh, this production of the, the uh, metal alloy. And because of the quality of the clay for kitty litter is uh, there's less quality in it and, and less there can be more imperfections in the clay they were less concerned about the other business line. And in essence, the kitty litter business line, if you know anything about kitty litter, most kitty litter is clay, is that um, that was a bigger part of their business and income into the company. And so there was more emphasis put there. So in essence, they were causing an imperfection in the clay, which ultimately trickled up to Chrysler and caused a malfunction in their cars. But You've got to understand all of those connections. And so we think about supply chains and we talk about the togetherness of supply chains and their connections and all those spheres of influences, where's our boundary, understanding the multiple perspectives on supply chains and how we balance that. And then the last concept in how we look at about and from things is understanding that when things come together, even their individual pieces might be important, but how those pieces come together can be even more important. And so there's a story about people in a dark room holding on to an elephant. And some have a hold of the, the trunk, some have a hold of the, the leg, and some have a hold of the tail. And some describe it as um, a hose, some describe what they hold on to as a snake, some describe what they hold on to as a tree trunk. So individually, their perception is incorrect, but it's based on what they know. Maybe they've never seen an elephant before. Maybe they've never held an elephant before. So they wouldn't even know if they touched one, what it felt like. Maybe they've seen one before, but never touched one. So in essence, they don't know, but they've touched a tree, they've touched a snake, and they've touched a hose. And so that's their perception. That's their knowledge base of the problem of a, or of what they have in front of them. So their perception is that. But if each individually were to describe what they have and they bring that information together, they would all go, oh, this is an elephant. And so sometimes we have to understand that there are multiple perspectives, that individual's perspective is correct, is right, based on what they know, but how we bring that information together, the whole is greater than the sum, will give us what we need to know about the real problem or what's in front of us. So here's a problem I'm gonna to give to you. All the information you need is in this problem. What we will learn from this problem is how perception and perspective gets us to a solution or an incorrect solution. So read this, we'll come back to it, uh, and I'll ask you to actually come up with your answer uh, for your final assignment. You can come back to the slide later, you can look at it in the PowerPoint slides that are posted up on Canvas. So the next one is how we look at good critical thinking. So good critical thinking is we're going to raise the right questions. 
And what I mean by that is that sometimes, one, we don't even ask questions, and two, are we asking the right questions? And so if someone came to me and said, I need a widget made in blue, and I go and make a bunch of widgets in blue, and I come back to them, I say, it's going to be $5 a widget, and they said, all I have is $4 a widget, then maybe, and then I tell them, well, but if I made it in red, I could have made it for $4. And they said, wow, I would have taken it in red. What I found out from that conversation was that color didn't matter, price did. But when they first came and articulated the problem to me, they said nothing about price or cost. So if I would have asked some questions at the beginning, I might have found that out, made it in red, and we never had that problem in the first place. So we've got to ask the right questions and even ask them in the first place. Thus, focusing on the real problem so that we know that what decisions are being made are addressing the real problem. We have to gather and assess relevant information. So we've got to do some digging. When presented with a problem, 95 to 90% 90 of the time when someone presents you with a problem, it's actually not the real problem. And you need to ask questions to get to the core of the problem. Most people are not good at articulating real, the real problem when expressing a problem. Uh, develops uh, well-reasoned conclusions and solutions. So, in order to understand the problem, we have to develop well-reasoned solutions, but we can't do that until we truly understand the real problem. And then we're gonna test that against um, information that we gain, and we'll get more about this in a minute. Relies on open-mindedness, and that's perspective, and we just talked about that. And then communicates effectively with others in figuring out solutions to problem, uh, complex problems. So. And not only do we have to clearly understand the problem, but we have to figure out how to clearly articulate the problem so that people can understand it. Cyclical, that assesses, I can start at one, move my way through to seven, go back to one again. And I might continue to adjust and refine and get better and better and better as I move through this. So this is also now another way of looking at how we look at problem definition as a process more from an organization or a company's perspective. And this is in a Harvard Business Review article. But basically it's the same thing, very similar to Checkman's first few steps. First, we have to establish the need for a solution. We can't solve problems that don't need to be solved. We need to justify the need. So why is it important to us and the company? We need to contextualize the problem. This is getting back to our root definitions and, and expressing the problem correctly. And then we need to write the problem statement. This is building our conceptual models. And so these are those first few steps that Checklin talks about. Uh, the first four steps of Checklin that get through here, building up to our conceptual models. But this is looking at it from a more of a corporate perspective and some of the key questions that I would ask as a company if I'm, par if I'm problem solving. Because then once I have written the problem statement so that we all understand it, then we can move forward with a solution. Or like I said before, maybe sometimes problems don't need solutions. So we have to begin to understand that our problems in today's society and world, these contemporary complexities, are a little bit more challenging than they have in the past. So sometimes we don't always know exactly what is the problem. It's not expressed to us that way. We have to understand what that is. And who and where are the problem owners, going back to the passive and active owners of problems. And then we also need to understand that sometimes the fixes create failures. This is what Peter Checklin, I mean not Peter, Peter Singe would call fixes that fail in system dynamics, and sometimes the answer is not as obvious as it first appears. There can be multiple uh, and incomplete sort of views of a problem and even solutions to a problem. And the purview of problem solvers, uh, often we love solutions, but don't love understanding problems. Uh, and so it gets ourselves in trouble. So that is sort of my nutshell perspective on how I want you to look at problems. I'm giving you some other things in class, some things to read, some things to look at, but I want you to begin to understand how to critically think about problems before we critically think about solutions.